Hey everyone, this is Elaine Welteroth and welcome back to Built to Last by American Express, a deep dive into the stories, history, and continued legacy of small businesses that shape American culture. This season, we are focusing on Black-owned businesses who need our support now more than ever. Black-owned small businesses and the Black community at large have been hit particularly hard by the social and political events that have defined our year. But we're excited to shine a light on the stories of thriving Black entrepreneurs in America. And we'll explore how the Black business leaders of our past have inspired and shaped not just the Black-owned businesses of today, but also the communities, the culture, and the zeitgeist of our country. Today's episode covers one of my personal favorite topics. We will be exploring the wonderful world of fashion with the help of Zarina Akers, the stylist behind some of the most iconic Beyonce looks. She's also the founder and curator of Black Owned Everything, a recently launched business directory that amplifies Black owned brands and the unique services and products. Zarina is the phenomenal wardrobe curator for some of our favorite celebrities, such as Chloe and Halle, Niecy Nash, and of course, the one and only Queen Bee. Zarina will take us on a journey through the 20th century where we'll meet Zelda Wynne Valdez, a pioneering fashion designer and the creator of the original iconic Playboy bunny costume. Zelda Wynne Valdez, the trailblazing fashion designer whose name we should all know, was born on June 28, 1905 in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. She honed her talent for sewing and designing as a teenager, observing her grandmother's work as a seamstress. She started by making outfits for her dolls and later made her first custom dress for her grandmother, who told the then young Zelda, quote, you can't sew for me, I'm too tall and too big. To her grandmother's surprise, Valdez created a dress that fit her perfectly. After graduating from high school in 1923, Valdez moved to White Plains, New York and began working at her uncle's tailoring shop. By the 1930s, Valdez got a job at an upscale boutique and became the shop's first black sales clerk and tailor. Valdez's career continued to flourish from there. In 1948, she opened her very own boutique in New York City called Che Zelda, located on Broadway and West 158th Street, making her the first black person to own a store on Broadway. Valdez quickly began to develop a reputation for her masterful creations, including countless designs that accentuated women's figures of all shapes and sizes. She was famous for being able to make red carpet worthy gowns for all women. Ella Fitzgerald was a frequent client of Valdez. Because Miss Fitzgerald was often too busy to come in for measurements, Valdez would carefully study photos of her and guess her size and measurements. Each time the gowns fit. Miss Fitzgerald became a regular, ordering quote, always three at a time. More often than not, Valdez had just a few days to deliver, as we often do. She was proud to admit that she never missed a deadline. Zelda Wynne Valdez's designs were particularly meaningful to her black clients. Despite their fame and wealth, women like Josephine Baker, Marian Anderson, Diane Carroll, Dorothy Dandridge, and Ruby Dee still faced racial discrimination in New York's most famous boutiques. These women found community and a safe haven in Valdez's shop. From Black Hollywood stars to New York's elite, everyone coveted a Valdez creation. Her signature sophisticated low-cut gowns even caught the eye of Hugh Hefner in the 1960s. Hefner was so impressed, he commissioned Valdez to create the original iconic Playboy bunny suit. The suit made its debut at the opening of the first Playboy club in Chicago. and. It was the first commercial uniform to be registered by the United States Patent and Trademark Office in 1964. In 1970, at the age of 65, Valdez was hired as the head costume designer for the famous Dance Theater of Harlem at the request of its founder, Arthur Mitchell. Mitchell admired Valdez's dedication to her craft. He even told journalists, quote, she takes the same kind of care and determination in sewing as I do in dancing. During her tenure, Valdez revolutionized dancewear for black dancers. 
Rather than continuing to subject dancers to wearing tights as a means to adhere to racially biased uniformity of classical ballet, Valdez dyed their tights to match their skin tone. Today, thanks in part to Valdez, black dancers can wear tights and point shoes that complement their complexion. Adding to her already remarkably impressive resume, Valdez was also a trained classical pianist. She co-founded the Harlem Youth Orchestra with Lester Wilson and was very involved in nurturing black youth in the arts. She designed hundreds of costumes for the Dance Theater of Harlem and taught design classes for thousands of Harlem children up until she passed away on September 26, 2001 at the age of 96. She lived a long purpose-driven life. Valdez told the New York Times, quote, I have a God-given talent for making people beautiful. She did so for people of all walks of life. Designing clothing for a variety of body types and sizes was revolutionary for its time. And let's be honest, it still is today. It's been widely discussed that the fashion industry has thrived on a culture of exclusion. Valdez set out to change that. She made it her mission to be inclusive when it wasn't popular, celebrated, or rewarded. Now is the time to give Zelda Wynn Valdez the honor she deserves for being one of the most influential designers of the 20th century, paving the way for future generations of Black designers to leave their mark on the world of fashion. What an incredible story. Thank you so much, Zarina, for sharing how Zelda Wynn Valdez truly laid down the foundation for all of us who love fashion and want to inject meaningful change into the industry to make it a more inclusive place. Because of her contributions, our next guest, Anifa Vwemba, founder of the clothing brand Hanifa, is not only carrying on Valdez's legacy, she is forging her own path, putting Black women at the center of her work. Hey, Anifa, how you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to have you on the show and to talk to you about your incredible story. You look beautiful, by the way. Are you wearing Hanifa right now? Thank you. I am. I am. You look amazing, too. I think you might be wearing some Hanifa as well. I am. <laughs> but thank you so much for sending this to me. I feel so fly, especially for given the fact that I haven't gotten dressed um, basically for the entire pandemic. So I'm feeling very put <laughs> together now. Thanks to you. Um, no problem. And actually, you know, I read about the inspiration for this collection and how how it's tied really explicitly to your roots in the Congo. Um, and I found it really interesting that you were very intentional about uh, waiting till you felt more established and that you had a reputation before really leaning into your roots because of sort of a fear of getting boxed in to this mm -hmm. sort of air quotes uh, African designer classification yeah. and, and, and you felt like that would box you in too much and that you really wanted to be established as a designer first mm -hmm. and foremost. Um, talk about, talk about, why you decided to to build your brand in this particular way and talk about the challenge um, of being an African designer. Yeah, um, I've, um, I'm very big on vision and I've had a big vision for Hanifa and what I wanted it to be. And I felt like starting out with like, you know, the African prints and, you know, the African attire would really box me in and just classify me as an African designer. Um, but I really wanted to build my brand up, um, get the recognition and, you know, have the really, really great customer base that would really see me for my talent and also, you know, you know, my great pieces and, you know, just overall the brand. And I felt like the time was right, you know, when we did launch. And I felt like if I would have done it sooner, it wouldn't have been as impactful as it was. Why was this the time? I felt like I, I feel like I reached a point in my brand where, you know, I had a great customer base. I had great supporters. Um, I'm really big on timing and I believe that there's a time for everything. And I just really felt like that was, this was the time, especially mm -hmm. during the pandemic, because, you know, as we know, everyone is on their phones. Everyone mm -hmm. is home. And mm -hmm. I felt like, wow, this is like the perfect time to really, you know, get everyone's attention and really also share um, 
the crisis that's going on in Congo with like the mining conditions and, you know, all of that stuff. And I really wanted to also expose that and in a way where I could also tie it into like fashion and, you know, really make it really cool for people to understand. Mm. Speaking of time, I want to go back in time. Um, when you hear the story of Zelda Wynn Valdez, what thoughts come to mind in terms of um, seeing yourself in her story? Um, and in what ways does her story sort of inspire you? Wow. I think Zelda is really um, a trailblazer, a pioneer. Um, And just to even think of what she had to go through at the time that she was, you know, Mm -hmm. began her career, um, it had to probably have been incredibly, like, difficult, maybe really hard. And I just really believe that she really knew her purpose um, and her truth, and she really lived in that. And you can really see that throughout her story. Mm -hmm. Um, And really, like, she really believed in herself. And even just taking it back to when she created um, the custom piece for her grandmother and, you know, her grandmother saying, oh, no, you know, this is too small or I'm too big or I'm too tall. And she literally created a custom piece for her grandmother. And I could really relate to that because I feel like... um, she, it's almost like she was creating solution wear for herself, mm. um, the women that she saw every day. And I feel like I'm, I'm almost doing the same thing. You know, I struggle when I shop. Um, I started my brand as a size, when I was personally a size um, two and now I'm a size 14. So I really see the struggle that black women face when they shop and how we're not really seen. Um, And so just creating a space for uh, black women also and where they can feel beautiful and and not feel like they have to go up 10 sizes because, you know, it's not really accommodating your your hips or your thighs. And Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm really, really inspired by Zelda's story and I can really, really relate to that. Mm. So learning about Zelda Wynn Valdez's journey and her vision to really make clothing that celebrated Black women's bodies, it's, it's, it's hard not to see this parallel between her vision and what you're doing today. It would be so good to hear you sort of describe what your aesthetic is and how, you know, celebrating Black women's curves was always really a part of, of what you wanted to, to, to do with your line. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just looking at myself, uh, my friends, my family, um, and just how we struggle with shopping, how I've struggled with shopping. I can recall times where I'm shopping for jeans and like I'll leave the store in tears because it literally does not fit me. And mm-hmm. and I know why it doesn't fit me. Um, and just also being able to talk to my customers and, you know, hear their concerns and what they go through when they're shopping. Um I found it. It's really important to to make sure that we have that and that we're that I'm celebrating that with my brand because I think a lot of times um, when something is like form fitting or if it's tight and it's showing your assets, it's like considered I don't know like uh, vulgar or just like too much in mm-hmm. the fashion industry. I feel like, but these are the assets that we have. Mm-hmm. We can't hide them, and mm-hmm. I really wanted to in a way, just celebrate that and also do it in a way where people can feel beautiful in it. and then they can really, really feel their best. Um, and just to help them with, you know, a lot of women go through like, you know, their insecurities. I was watching mm-hmm. something earlier today when someone was like, I used to get made fun of because my booty's big. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, but that's what you have. Why, you know? Um, and I just wanted to, you know, somehow assist with that and just make people feel beautiful every single day. I love it. It's so relatable, that challenge that you're talking mm-hmm. about. Um, and it's so funny because it's not, it, it feels like these solutions that you're presenting through your collections, um, they feel innovative and they feel frankly under, you know, underrepresented in this industry. But these challenges go all the way back throughout history. And I feel like that's what we see when we explore, you know, Zelda's story. Um, You know, we we learn that she was making gowns for women with all different body types. She was dyeing ballet tights and, you know, point shoes to match black, you know, dancers, skin tones. She was doing this well before her time, uh, really 
kind of Incredible. ignoring the norms of, of fashion and, and the trends that, you know, in, in mainstream fashion. And I feel like similarly, you're paving your own way by defying traditional, mm -hmm. you know, trends in the fashion business. Um, you know, you're, you're using social media in groundbreaking ways. It, it's hard to even wrap my brain around the fact that you're not even 30 yet. You have this booming business, this really successful um, brand that's blossoming by the day and that started almost nine years ago, which means you started as a baby uh, in yeah. college. Um, and from what I've read, I, I understand that you actually you dropped out of college to pursue your career dreams in fashion. Talk about what that journey was like for you and the role that mentorship played along the way. Yeah, um, I really, um, I've always been fascinated with fashion. I just honestly didn't know which route I would take. And it honestly really wasn't until my, I believe this was like my sophomore year in college. And I was just not happy. I, I didn't mm. like what I was studying in school. I was working in retail. I didn't like my job either. And it was actually around the time of my 21st birthday. And I actually took a fashion design class in um, high school where I kind of learned how to sew a little bit. And so over time, I would buy like fabrics and just random things that I really loved. And I remember being a, a broke college <laughs> dropout, <laughs> not really having, you know, you know, it's your 21st birthday, so you want to look really good. <laughs> I think we were even throwing a party um, and I was like, wow, I'm broke and I don't have anything to wear. So I, I put together a dress um, and posted it on Instagram. And it that's really, honestly, really what started Hanifa, to be quite honest. And, you know, I started getting a lot of requests and from friends and family. Um, and the journey has been really, really, um, in the beginning, incredibly lonely because mm. I felt like, there weren't really any resources at the time. I didn't really have anyone to call. I didn't have anyone to talk to. Um, I even remember reaching out to some people. Just like, you know, it's it was so new to me. I was so eager to learn. Um, I was so passionate about it. I wanted to do it so bad, but I, I there was just absolutely no resources. Um, mm. And I'm in Maryland, so it's like, everyone's in New York or everyone's in LA or Paris. And I'm just like, what do you do if you're trying to be a designer in Maryland? So. It was a lot of winging it moments. So I, I, I learned from my mistakes. Um, and that's really what I did. I, it was a lot of trial and error. I made plenty of mistakes. Um, I, there was even a point in time where I actually completely quit because it mm. was so overwhelming. Um, but yeah, it's been a very interesting journey, also a very evolving journey as well. Mm. What would you say were some of the biggest challenges that you faced? Uh, I would say early on, like just finding the resources or just kind of a blueprint to follow. Right. Um, and once I kind of got in the hang of being a businesswoman, I think um, having a solid team, <laughs> that mm. was really... Everything. Game changing. I mean, I think even now, I, I, it's it's still something that I deal with every now and then. But I think, you know, having a really good team is so important because you can't do this alone. <laughs> I've tried that right. and failed miserably. Um, and I think having, you know, people on your team that have a great work ethic, who believes in your vision, you know, who want to support your vision mm -hmm. um, and who understands where you want to take your company or your brand is really important. And I think that's something that I really struggle with over the years. Mm -hmm. And how did you ultimately overcome those challenges? I mean, you, you talk about being a designer, a self-made self-taught, young, black, female designer <laughs> in a market that is sort of outside of, you know, the, 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 the center of the fashion universe, which is New York City or even LA, right? So you have all, mm -hmm. these, all these challenges, all these barriers stacked up against you. How did you overcome all of that? What, what are some of the greatest lessons you, you've learned? My greatest lesson was probably actually taking a step back so the year that I did actually quit um, Hanifa temporarily, um, I really, you know, I did a lot of soul searching and just really trying to find myself and really understand why. Like, why, why do I have this dream? Why do I have this talent? Why do I have this business? And, you know, I, I gave my life to Christ at the time and mm -hmm. 
I then knew when I, I, I actually took a whole year off. At that moment, I knew that, you know, this is my purpose. This is actually what I'm supposed to do. There's millions of women out there who struggle with certain things and insecurities um, with their bodies. And, you know, I felt like I have a place in that. Um, to, uh, I have a solution. And and this is where I, I had to come in. So um, I think a lot of times, you know, it's hard to kind of check yourself and also mm. to look back at the mistakes that you've made. And I think I've done a really good job at really analyzing myself and my mistakes and checking myself mm. and just like moving forward, this is what I'm going to do. And this is how I'm going to do things better. And this is how I'm going to learn from my mistakes. This is how I'm going to hire new people. You know, just all those things um, factor into that. And I think um, just really honestly learning from your mistakes and moving forward. Everything that you're saying is so relevant to the times that we're living in right this minute. I think mm -hmm. a, I love to hear, you know, how important it was for, for your business to take a beat to pause, to do mm -hmm. some self-reflection, um, because I think a lot of business owners are being forced to do uh, that very thing right now through this pandemic, right? It's put us yeah. all on this pause. And I think being able to really dig into your why and reprioritize your business accordingly um, can really set you up for some some even bigger wins. Even if it, even if you're in the midst of a setback now, that doing that that sort of that introspective work can really set you up for some even bigger wins. Um, and and to that point, you, my friend, have managed <laughs> to kill it in the midst of COVID nineteen when so many Ooh. businesses, especially small black owned businesses, um, have really been struggling to stay alive. You've been thriving. Um, and it's really a testament to your, uh, you know, deep understanding of how to utilize technology as a tool to maintain a really valuable relationship with your, with your customer, um, and to stand out from the crowd. So I actually found out about you. I discovered <laughs> you on the internet. And, um, <laughs> so I want to hear from you about your incredible pivot during this pandemic and how you utilize technology to do what I'm calling like uh, <laughs> the first that I've seen, certainly a, a, a fashion show, like a ghost model fashion show. <laughs> I mean, I don't, that can't be the right way to say it. So you please talk, talk about this fashion show that you developed on the internet that like required no models, no physical runway, but that really swept fashion week. You yeah, won Fashion so, Week, by the way. I just need to just <laughs> crown you and just give you the medal right now. Thank you so much. Um, I've always, um, I was just telling um, my assistant earlier, I was just like, if I wasn't doing this fashion thing, I probably would have been doing tech or something else. So I've always been like fascinated with tech. And um, when I was a kid, I used to like take computers apart and put them back together. So it was always something that I loved. Um, and being able to kind of bridge the two, like I love fashion and I love tech, I think was really cool. So I actually started um, kind of playing around with the 3D technology for a few years. Um, but it really, to be quite honest, it wasn't until like, you know, the pandemic happened. And now like I have a lot of free time and, you know, I can learn something new. I'm like, OK, what can I learn or what can I kind of resume or go back to that I've been putting off? And I was mm. like, OK. This 3D thing, I really want to learn it. I've been like kind of tapping around, kind of playing around with it, but I really, really want to get into it. So I just remember like downloading programs and I'm just like, like the type of person, like once I really love something and I want to do it, I'm going to go in. I'm going to watch a million YouTube videos. I'm going to buy books. I'm going to just do as much research as I possibly can just so I can know. Um, and that's exactly what I did. So did a lot of research and I was like, okay, boom, I know how to model the 3D garments. How can I animate this thing? And then I started to um, research and understand that mo the movie industry actually has been doing this type of stuff for years. I mean, since the beginning of time, basically. And, you know, especially with Fashion Week and now with the pandemic, you're seeing so many big fashion houses saying like, hey, we're not participating anymore. We're going to do our own thing. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I've been doing my own thing and now I'm really going to do my own thing and just do this fashion show. So I got a team of animators 
Um, and we got to work and it was a very extremely tedious process. And I'm so proud of my team and what we were able to accomplish. To be quite honest, we weren't really even like planning to do like anything mind blowing. It was just like, look, you know, it's a pandemic. <laughs> we're terrified and we don't know what to do. This is a way that we can be creative and express ourselves. So um, that's what we did. And honestly, when we launched, uh, when the show came, uh, became live, it was like a moment of silence for all of us. We were just like, whoa. What really motivated you to bet on yourself and to not take mm. the conventional <laughs> route? I've always been a person where if I wanted to do something and I had a vision for it, I'm going to do it. No matter how long it takes, how hard it gets, Like I'm just going to have to do it. And I think just having that tunnel vision Believing myself, also having faith also, I think really mm. helped me along the way. And just mm. really understanding, like, no matter what, I know this is my purpose. So it's going to succeed yep. regardless. Yep. However way it takes me to get there, I'm going to get there. But I know this is really why I'm here and this is what mm. I'm supposed to do. And I think really understanding your purpose, mm. I think that purpose is almost that tunnel vision that you need. Because I think a lot of times people operate or we operate in a way where we don't really understand what we're doing. We don't know why we're doing it. But mm. once you really know like, hey, this is why you're here and this is your purpose, and I think that's all you need because mm -hmm. you should do whatever you can. You should live your life living in that truth and in that purpose. Yeah. I mean, you talked earlier a little bit about the boxes that this industry and this world tries to put you in um, that can feel limiting. Uh, and so I'm curious, in what ways have you felt boxed in and, what, and, and how have you managed to kind of break out of those limiting labels that have been put on you? I, I remember there were moments where I felt like there's no way I'm going to get in this fashion industry because I just feel like... <laughs> I'm just an outsider. I just mm. don't fit in. I don't know. I just don't fit in. And that actually, I'm actually happy and grateful for that because that really led me to create my own world. And yep. this is how I see my brand. This is how I see myself. This is how I see Hanifa being successful. And I created what success was to me because I felt like I couldn't reach it in the way that it was intended for it to be. If you were a designer, if you were an emerging designer, if this is if this is um, the path that you're supposed to take when you want to get into the fashion industry. I just felt like it was so out of reach. I didn't go to a fashion school in New York. I didn't go to a fashion school at all. So I was just like, wow, like I'm there's just no hope for me in the fashion industry. So mm -hmm. just creating that for myself, um, I think, um, allow me to really thrive and just really honestly enjoy the process, enjoy what mm -hmm. I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It's so inspiring. I mean, as somebody who, you know, comes from a traditional fashion media background, um, I applaud you for not going the traditional route, for, you know, not needing to get validated by the vogues of the world, um, mm -hmm. but still connecting with a valuable audience and you know you've dressed everyone from Tracy Ellis Ross to Mary J Blige um and and you mean a lot to the culture so how did you manage to you know get your work in front of influential black figures that were you knew would connect with the the audience and the the, the customer base that you wanted to reach without going the traditional route I utilized Instagram so much. Um, mm. You know, as I shared early on, it, it was the beginning of Hanifa. So just really understanding that side and how it worked. So in the mm -hmm. beginning, before they changed like the algorithm, it was like, um, you know, if I posted a picture and Elaine, you saw it and you liked it, then your thousands of followers would possibly see it. And then if they like it, and then it just, it would just go, uh, keep going. And at that moment, I was just like, well, um, my customers are actually going to see my photos first before they actually see the physical garment. So it was really important for me to perfect my visuals. So I started investing into photography and I started investing mm -hmm. into graphic design. So I started teaching myself these things um, 
so many aspects of like the marketing and creative part of my business. And um, I made and I made sure that every time I posted a picture, every time we took a picture that, you know, when a customer would see it, they would just be like, I got to have this photo. Mm-hmm. I got to have this garment. Mm-hmm. I got to have this thing. I, I'm using my rent money. I'm using my... <laughs> my bill money to buy this and that's what I did and that's how I grew my customer base that's how I grew my following and I also had to make sure that you know the pictures look good but I also had to make sure that the quality matched that as well so absolutely um, but but yeah so that's what I did and it and it just kept growing and it just kept growing and it just kept growing and then eventually stylists started to see that the brand and they started reaching out and wanted to do pools and then you know um in May, when we did the the fashion show on Instagram, mm. everyone saw that. And then, you know, people started reaching out after that as well. So I think it's a lot of utilizing what you have um, and making it work for you and your business. And that's what I've been doing. I've just been utilizing my resources and, mm-hmm. and, and stretching and doing as much as I can with what I had. And, and this is what we've got. I love hearing your story because it just reminds me so much of how, you know, Zelda was able to design for the Diane Carrolls of the world, the Ella Fitzgeralds of the world, and so many other famous black women singers and actresses of her time. What do you think it means to these women that you've dressed from Mary J. Blige to Zendaya to Ciara to be able to support you, a black, young you know, female business owner, especially in a climate like this one? Um, I think the most important thing is them feeling beautiful and good in the garments. And just also knowing that, wow, like I look amazing. I love this. And it's a young black designer um, that designed this piece. Like, I think it's almost like a proud moment, like, wow, this is such a moment. This is also a moment for them as well. And just, you know, it's 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 just honestly just support, genuine support. I think it's one thing if you're just like sending something to someone and they're just wearing it because whatever, you know, but someone actually like wearing it and looking good and you know they feel good in the piece. Mm. It's just like it's it's such a surreal moment. I think for me, and I think it's an incredibly uh, proud moment for them as well. Yeah. I think this is a moment where, you know, Black celebrities are recognizing the power and the influence of their platforms and their bodies are platforms. So, you know, in this moment, Black Lives Matter, where there is more of an emphasis on celebrating and supporting Black-owned businesses, Black creators like yourself, I think think it, you know, it's important that we are conscious of, how our dollars um, are, you know, being spent and who they're yep. supporting. So it's just incredible to see the way that, you know, you've connected with your 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 audience and how these black celebrities have embraced you. And and yeah. and and why wouldn't they? Because you're you make us look cute. I mean, not that I'm a celebrity, <laughs> but I, I feel cute. I I think you make such incredible Thank clothing. You. Um, and it's just, it's just, it's like a cherry on top to find out that you are this young black woman who's been at this thing on your own terms. It just, it just makes us feel good in a moment like this to be able to support you. So Anifa, what is your vision for the future of your business and how you want to have an impact in your community? Um, future of Hanifa. I, I really hope to continue to grow, um, continue to grow, expand, and also really give back. Um, I started an initiative called Concepts by Anifa M. Um, Right now I'm mentoring um, emerging designers. I manufacture for emerging designers. I teach a class every other month just because I know what it's like, you know, in the beginning, how I didn't have any resources, how I, I didn't know how to do anything. And I get so many questions, I get so many DMs, I get so many emails, and I just want to give back in that way and really help, you know, the next designer or Mm. whoever else needs help and just really share my knowledge and what I've learned over the years. That's incredible. Anifa, you clearly killed it in the pandemic. You are a rock star. But what advice do you have for other small business owners who haven't 
been able to, you know, navigate the challenges of the pandemic as gracefully as you have? What are, what, what's like one really important piece of advice that you would give struggling business owners out there? So at the beginning of the pandemic, I freaked out really bad. Like I was like, this is the end. <laughs> you're not the, you're not the only one, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is the end. I was like, I don't even know if we could post. I'm like crying, like the world is suffering. I can't, I can't share. I can't post anything. We can't put anything out. And my team was just like, Anifa, get it together. People want to shop. People want to feel inspired. We have to get back to work. And soon as we had that conversation, it was like go time. So I really do believe like the people that you keep around you and the team that you have around you really um, helps, especially in times like this. And just mm. really taking the time to really understand your business um, coming up with a new strategy and just really focusing on what it is that you and your business need at the time. Boom. Such great <laughs> advice. That was great. Um, Thank you. All right. So obviously this is a podcast that's all about uplifting and celebrating and patronizing Black-owned businesses. So I hope that all of our listeners um, go out and shop Hanifa. But apart from your brand, what are some other small uh, or just Black-owned businesses that you think should be on people's radars? Honestly, my favorite brand, one of my favorite brands right now is Kai Collective. Um, It's a UK-based brand. And she's been killing it during the pandemic. And mm. she's young. She's also thriving. Also, just trying to wing it as well and, and just learn the best way that she can. Um, I had a few conversations with her. She's great. Um, but yeah, I would definitely say check out Kai Collective. Um, and yeah. and see What kinds of love. clothing? Is it, is it a clothing brand? Yeah, it's a clothing brand. Um, women's wear. Um, yeah. Beautiful. I think we got it, Anifa. You killed yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. You killed it too. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was so nice connecting with you. I've been, you too. honestly, I've been watching your journey since like Teen Vogue days. So Aww. it's so cool to just even speak to you. It's so Aww, cool. Oh, that means so much. Anyway, I'll let you go. It was such a pleasure to Thank connect with you. you. Let's definitely stay in touch. For sure. Thank you so much. All right. So what have we learned here? Number one. Ask yourself, what problem are you trying to solve with your business? Let that guide you. Number two, how can you leverage the power of technology to really innovate in your space? And number three, do you have the right people around you to keep you focused on your mission, even through the hard times? Really, really important questions I think we'd all benefit from asking ourselves right now. This episode illuminates the power of purpose, conviction, and setting clear intentions as an entrepreneur. Both Zelda and Anifa built their businesses on inclusivity and really designing for a diverse customer base. As a result, they were both able to satisfy an unmet need in the market and create beautiful, functional, and purpose-driven clothing for the culture. If you guys enjoyed this podcast episode as much as I did, please be sure to tell your friends about it. And if you haven't already, please subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amex's YouTube page, or wherever you're listening to this right now. And let us know your thoughts by reaching out to us at American Express on social media or by using the hashtag Amex Built to Last. I'm Elaine Welteroth, and you are listening to Built to Last, a podcast by American Express. To support Hanifa, please visit www.hanifa.co or follow Hanifa on Instagram at Hanifa Official.